Hey there, and welcome back to Mass Effect 2. My name is Pete, and today, after a slightly longer break in the action, we complete another episode of our Mass Effect 2 Insanity walkthrough. And we will continue where we left off last time, having just investigated a not-so-abandoned collector ship. At the end of the last episode, we had a short chat with the elusive man who already pointed us towards the next major plot mission, but that one will have to wait for a while as we have quite a few other things to take care of first. Our first stop in today's episode will be the Tech Lab, where we can now research a few more upgrades. All of them can be found in the Armor Upgrade section, and we start with the Damage Protection Upgrade, which will give our entire squad a solid 20% bonus to shields, barriers and armor. Completing this project immediately unlocks the next one, so let's grab that as well. For 15,000 units of palladium, we can now research the redundant field generator, which sometimes kicks in and immediately restores our shields back up to full capacity after they have been depleted. That is very handy indeed, but we're not done yet. Up next, we already have the third of five tech damage upgrades, this one providing our squad with a nice 30% damage bonus to all tech powers. And once again, this project also unlocks another one, so let's grab the tech cooldown upgrade as well, which decreases the cooldown time for our squad's tech powers by 20%. And that's all we can research, so let's return to the CIC now and have a quick chat with Kelly next. You had me so worried when you were trapped on the collector ship. Thank goodness for Edie. Well, it seems like our dinner with Kelly a while back may have sparked something, because she certainly appears to be very concerned about our well-being. That sounds like more than just professional concern, Kelly. You're more than just my commander. You're my friend. Edie brought you back to me. If she had a body, I'd give her a big hug. Alright, she's taking the path of friendship, at least for now, but that should not stop us from giving praise to the entire crew, including her, which will also give us the first two Paragon points of this episode. Normandy crew delivered, including you. You're too kind. We were there to help, but Edie gets the credit this time. The elusive man made sure Edie was installed for this mission. Now I see why. Anyway, how may I help you, Commander? That'll be all. Good luck out there, Shepard. Commander, you've received a new message at your private terminal. Okay, we have a few messages waiting for us, so let's see who's writing. Up first, we have a thank you message from Raphael Colon, the governor of the Far Gone Colony on Jonas. If you remember, back in episode 31, we went on board of the MSV Broken Arrow, a ship on collision course with this colony. We fought our way through a few waves of Geth, re-enabled the ship's engines and prevented a catastrophic crash, and unsurprisingly, the colony is very thankful for our services. The next message here can then safely be classified as Mass Effect's version of religious chain letter spam, as we can read a story about a Drell who was apparently cured of his Keppel syndrome, the same disease that Thane has by the way, simply because he believed in the Hannah in Kindlers. I will not comment any further on this, let's simply mark it as red and move on. This third and final message is then arguably the most interesting one, as it comes from Shorban, the Solarian who gave us the infamous Scan the Keepers quest in Mass Effect 1. Interestingly, when he evaluated the scans we took of the Keepers, Shorban found that they had been engineered millions of years ago, apparently by the same people who also made Sovereign. And this of course makes them much, much older than the Protheans, who are commonly believed to be the constructors of the Citadel. However, as we learned in Mass Effect 1, the Citadel is actually a secret mass relay, a backdoor for the Reapers to return from dark space, so his findings should not surprise us too much. However, Shorban also reveals that roughly every 50,000 years, the Keepers are supposed to react to some kind of signal, probably the one to activate the Citadel relay, but we know from Mass Effect 1 that they did not do that this time around, which is why the Reaper Sovereign appeared to manually take control over the Citadel. All in all, a very interesting finding, however, as I said, nothing that comes as too much of a surprise. So the Collectors were once Protheans, repurposed by the Reapers. What a sad end. Makes you wonder if the Keepers on the Citadel were once something different. Our crew members then actually have a very similar discussion regarding the Keepers, although after so much time has passed, we can't really give them an answer to their questions. Instead, we will now embark on the first of two small assignments in this episode. Investigating the collectorship last time has dropped us off in the Balor system, however, quest-wise we won't actually find anything here. However, we can still have a quick look around the system just for the sake of completion, starting with the tiny rock planet Elatha. 
This one is rich in minerals, primarily in iridium, of which it holds roughly 15,000 units. That makes it a very good target for mining, however, not the only one in this system. Up next, we have Celestin, just a moon but one that actually lends its name to the entire system cluster here, which is called the Celestin Rift. The moon itself is of interest as well because it has a solid deposit of element zero, and that can at times be very hard to find in this game. For the moment though, we have enough of it, so let's move on to the planet that Celestin is orbiting around, and that would be the gas giant Cernunos. If you're looking to mine, this planet can safely be skipped. Apart from comparatively meager deposits of iridium and platinum, you won't find anything here. That brings us to Partholon, an icy planet near the outskirts of the system, and a planet that is much more interesting from a mining perspective as well. Not only does it have a small amount of element zero, but also a vast deposit of platinum, so if you're lacking that, this is a good place to restock. One more planet is still missing, but before we go to that, we can quickly refuel the Normandy. We have a fairly lengthy trip around the cluster plant, and we don't want to run out of fuel midway through. The fifth and final planet of the system is then the dwarf planet Bress, which is located right in the middle of the system's asteroid belt, and which is once again rich in minerals, primarily iridium and palladium. That completes the ballast system, but we have a few more still left to go in this cluster, so let's burn some fuel and travel over to the Talava system, the location of our next quest. Anomaly detected. As we enter orbit around the palladium-rich desert planet Titus, Edie detects an anomaly, and with the report of unregistered starships in the area, let's have a look at what we're dealing with. Have found something. Okay, our scanners have detected a disabled heavy mech, not exactly what one might expect based on the planet's description, but apparently there are also large quantities of mineral resources nearby, so let's land and investigate. For this mission we'll take Samara and Morden because both of them have not seen any action lately. In the end though, it really does not matter who we go with here. After leveling up in the last episode, we now also finally have enough squad points to max out and evolve the incendiary ammo power, so let's do exactly that. For the ability evolution, we now have the choice between Inferno ammo and squad incendiary ammo. Inferno ammo further increases the fire damage of this ammo power and also adds an area of effect to the damage, while squad incendiary ammo does not upgrade the damage of the power any further, but instead makes it available for all squad members. Now, that seems very useful, but considering how Shepard is our main damage dealer by far, we should do everything in our power to improve his ability to dish out punishment, and that is why we will go with Inferno Ammo instead of Squad Incendiary. Up next, we have Morden, who now also has enough squad points to max out and evolve his Incinerate ability. For the ability evolution, we now have the choice between Heavy Incinerate and Incineration Blast. Heavy Incinerate focuses on the damage side of things, as it further increases the damage the ability deals, while Incineration Blast increases the impact radius, potentially allowing this power to affect multiple targets. And hitting multiple targets at once, that is very nice, however, let's not forget that Heavy Incinerate also has an impact radius, however, of course, one that is comparatively small. Still, if multiple enemies are grouped very closely together, both ability evolutions here will be able to hit them, giving Incineration Blast the advantage really only when you stumble upon looser enemy formations. And that reasoning is why we go with Heavy Incinerate instead, as it also increases Morden's effectiveness against single high-level enemies. Lastly then, we have Samara in a very similar situation, so let us max out and evolve her throw ability. And also very similarly, we now have the choice between the more powerful heavy throw and the more area of effect oriented throw field. However, unlike Morden's incineration ability, throw is not really used as a damage dealing power, instead it shines as a crowd control power. And for that reason, we will go with the throw field here, which now allows us to throw around multiple enemies at once, something that heavy throw would not at all be capable of. And with that we're ready, we don't really need to worry about weapons for this mission, so we can simply head planet side now. I am detecting a large supply of resources buried deep within the canyon walls. Heavy explosives will be required to excavate them. Right, here we are, Edie just mentioned a large amount of valuable resources and a potential way to get them, and maybe that mech in front of us can be the key, so let's learn a bit more about it. It says here that the mech was bought from Herod, the Elko merchant that you might remember from Omega, and it's also mentioned that the mech is having some power issues. 
Luckily, whoever bought it left some power cells lying around, so now it's only a matter of activating the mech in the first place. And that can be achieved with a simple round of the bypassing minigame, after which the mech springs into action. In the bottom right corner you can now see its power levels, and it will only take a few seconds for that bar to fully deplete. Once that happens, the mech powers down again, but luckily the first power cell here is close by. And using its machine gun, the mech has just blasted free a path through the mountain, so let's follow that path and see where it leads us. The mech is not hostile, as a matter of fact it will actually follow us. Well, actually it has a predetermined path that it will walk on no matter what we do. Still, to complete this mission we will have to take the very same path, which does, after a few moments, lead us to the next supply of power cells. The mech is unfortunately a little bit slower than us, so we'll have to wait for it to catch up. Running ahead is pointless because right at this moment it once again loses power, so let's pop in another power cell and continue onwards. As you can see, we have also switched over to the assault rifle because there is a tiny, tiny amount of combat in this mission. However, it is by no means anything that you need to plan for. If approached carefully, the enemies will not even have a chance to damage you. Looking down, we can spot two Varen who have crowded around the next crate of power cells and who absolutely do not stand a chance against assault rifle fire from above. Using a carefully timed incinerate also gets us one step closer to the incineration specialist achievement, as Morden's ability here burns away the rest of one of the Varen's armor. The mech, meanwhile, is once again getting low on power, so let's head down to the Varen corpses and grab the power cells. And as you can see by the red blinking in the power bar in the lower right corner, the mech has once again deactivated itself, so let's retrace our steps to enable it to continue its path. And yes, this was all the combat that awaits us in this mission. The whole thing is also very short and will end in just a few minutes, but considering the rather slow and long-winded nature of this mission, I think that is perfectly fine. The final crate of power cells is then very easy to find as it's located right next to the path here. However, after grabbing it, we will once again have to wait for a while until the mech eventually makes it over to us. Now, in case you're wondering, because lots of minerals were mentioned both in the mission description and by Edie earlier, no, we have not walked past any of those yet, but we will be able to get our hands on something special in just a moment. For now, though, we can simply continue onwards. However, we soon run into a dead end, and at this point we want to keep a safe distance. Alright, the path is open, but the mech has been destroyed. That is not a problem for us, however, because our reward is conveniently located right ahead of us. And here we are, that completes this small and somewhat tedious mission. We recovered some resources, but apart from that found not much else of interest. In total we gained 125 experience points, 7,500 credits in Cerberus funding, and the rather lackluster amount of 5,000 units of platinum. Yes, we could have gotten that multiple times over simply by scanning the system that we're in, but let's not complain here, at least we did not have to use any probes. Speaking of which, with this mission completed we can actually head right back into the galaxy map immediately, because three more planets in the Talava system deserve our attention. The first of those is the rock planet Mitrum, used by the Tyrians for prisons and interrogation centers, but actually also very rich in iridium, of which you should easily be able to find more than 15,000 units here. Moving on, we have the extremely hard volcanic planet Cautius, not as mineral rich as Mitrum but still holding a few deposits, with Iridium once again being the largest of those. To conclude our tour through the system, we now visit the radiation riddled rock planet Itarus, which is another step below Cautius in terms of its mineral deposits, but can once again also serve as a solid supply of Iridium. 
And with that, this system is complete as well, time to move on to the next one. And that system would be the Solveig system, which only houses three planets, the third of which, however, will offer us another small quest to complete. Before we get to that, however, we can visit the gas giant Thrivaldi, which reportedly has pirate activity in its vicinity. But for now, it's quiet and generally speaking, it's also not a place worth staying too long, because in terms of minerals, this planet does not really have a lot to offer. On the desert planet Soto, the story is a different one. This planet near the center of the system has a huge palladium deposit, albeit only low quantities of platinum and iridium. And that brings us now to Soto's moon, Sinmara. Anomaly detected. ED detects an anomaly, and we can already guess what that might be, because there is a research station in orbit around this moon, while the moon itself, just like the planet it's orbiting around, is very close to the system's sun. Magnetic shielding failure detected. Catastrophic solar radiation exposure probable. Magnetic shielding failure detected. Catastrophic so I have found something. And here we have it confirmed, it is indeed the research station that is in danger. Apparently, the station's magnetic fields were disabled or malfunctioned, and as a result, it now no longer has any protection against radiation storms. At the moment, solar activity is low, so we're able to land, so let's do that and try to get those shields back up and running. And here we are, we don't even get to select a squad for this, which is already a good indicator of the comparatively short length of this mission. And our task here on the station is very straightforward indeed. All we have to do is reactivate the station's shields and while we're on our way to do that, we can even salvage 2000 units of palladium. As we approach the platform where we can take care of that, however, our path is suddenly blocked, but this is nothing that a short bypass can solve. In the middle of the platform here, we have a control switch that enables one of three terminals. Ahead of us, we have shield control, which will need to activate the shields. To the left, we have a cooling unit, and to the right, we have the shield generator. And the first thing we want to activate, that is the cooling unit. Otherwise, the shield generator will overheat and we can't turn them on. So, let's establish a connection with the switch in the middle here, and then the unit can be activated. Now that cooling is provided, we can flick the switch over to the shield generator, which is, as the name suggests, ultimately responsible for keeping the shield up. With the generator working, all that is now left to do is to actually activate the shields using the shield control panel. So let's flick the switch back over to that terminal and then wrap up the mission with one last bypass. And here we are, that was quick and easy, the shields are back up, the station is now protected again, and we have completed another mission. And because this was another mission obtained by planet scanning, we have now unlocked the agent achievement. As a matter of fact, we may have actually unlocked that a few episodes ago, it's not always exactly clear which types of missions count for this achievement. On top of that, we gain 125 experience points, 7,500 credits, and 2,000 units of palladium. Not bad at all for a mission that from start to finish took us roughly 3 minutes to complete. And here we are now, back on the Normandy, with two completed missions under our belt and approaching the end of today's episode. And we can wrap things up with another line from Kelly Chambers, this time regarding our resident assassin Thane Krios. I'm surprised by Thane's spiritual side. His psych profile mentioned little of it. And he carries himself with such cold confidence. I'm not sure if I find him scary or sexy. And just to extend the conversation, we'll go with one of the most generalizing answers I've seen so far in this game. But then again, it's the only way to actually respond to what Kelly was saying. A lot of women like bad boys. Oh, I don't know. Good guys are pretty nice too. Anyway, how may I help you, Commander? That'll be all. Good luck out there, Shepard. And here we are now at the end of today's episode. I think we'll actually stay in this cluster for a while longer, because this cluster is also where one of the larger DLCs for this game begins, so probably in the next episode we'll have a closer look at the Firewalker pack. Until then, I hope you enjoyed today's episode, and if you did, then I would be happy if you could leave a thumbs up, or if you want to support the channel further, then you can of course also subscribe, or check out and maybe pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.